Okay, we're underway. So welcome again to the first Ripper Box planning software showcase. Ripper meaning the reducing invalid planning applications tool and Box meaning the back office planning systems tool. We're going to start by giving you a bit of background to where Ripper Box have come from. If you're not familiar with it, um, you'll see an end to end demo of, of the tools that are processing LDC applications in three councils at the moment. Here are some lessons learned from Southwark and talk about opportunities and next steps. So my name is Matt Woodhill. I work at MHCLG, uh, where I'm the head of planning software. I'm going to be joined today by Emily Hadley from Buckinghamshire Council and Tom Buttrick from Southwark. So you'll hear from those in a few moments time. But first of all, I'm going to take you on a kind of a tour of the, the story, I suppose, that got us to where we are today. Uh, it might be some things that you've been familiar with, um, but hopefully it helps you understand where we've come from, where we are and, and where we're going. So to start with, I'll just talk a bit about the local digital movement, which some of you might be familiar with, because it's it's an interesting jumping off point for where everything stems from. Um, the local digital declaration was established in 2018 by 45 founding organisations. It's a, a visionary document um, and it shares vision and ambition for the way that the sector wants to work and the way that services should be designed and run, specifically digital services. It looks a bit like this. Um, these are the five core principles there. So designing services around users needs, supporting technology to be uh, interoperable with an emphasis on standardized data. And it's all about more modular services that reduce the dependence on kind of mammoth monolithic um, legacy systems that I'm sure many of you are working with. It's also got safety and security in terms of cyber security and safe sharing of personal data at its core. Crucially, I think when it gets to about numbers four and five, it becomes more about culture. So encouraging digital leadership that contributes to genuine organizational change. And then lastly, working openly and collaboratively so that we're solving our common problems once, but so that we're sharing our learnings and reusing some of the um, great things that people are coming up with. So far, over 230 councils have signed the declaration and what councils get is free access to free training and they can apply for funding for digital projects via the local digital fund. There's actually an open funding round um, open right now and it closes in about a week's time. So if you're looking for something that is well planning related or other and you've got an idea and you want to get it off the ground, then do go over to localdigital.gov.uk to find out a bit more about that. The purpose of the fund then is to stimulate the development, research and development of ideas um, into innovative ways of solving problems. And two projects that have received funding to date have been uh, Ripper and Bops. So Bops, the story there, well, this, is, this was initiated in 2019. It was led by Southwark Council with four additional partners. Got their logos just down there. So in addition to Southwark, um, Bucks and uh, Lambeth, who you're going to be hearing today, we've got Toby Hamilton also on the call, who's going to be joining in the discussion later. Also Coventry and Camden Councils. And they came together because they identified an opportunity to improve the efficiency of back office case management systems that they were using. Um, they were looking to improve this by using planning data in a new and improved way. The data, not document story that you're going to hear more about as we go on and to improve the planning officer's user experience. If it's been led by the councils with Unboxed as a delivery partner, providing design and development support and the MHCOG role up until relatively recently has been fairly light touch. So there was a collaboration manager working with the, the team on a weekly basis. Um, to to kind of support them with engagement and to uphold some of the declaration values and coach the teams to to ensure the processes are moving in in accordance to the principles that um, that you've just seen on the previous slide. Ripper, the reducing invalid planning applications project, started a little bit later in November 2019. Uh, that's led by Lambeth Council, although you'll see some of the same partners there. In fact, all the same except um, for Northumberland being there with the uh, in place of uh, in place of Coventry. And that's building on the work that actually was initiated by Open Systems Labs, um, find out if you need planning permission service, and they've been working really closely with the team to date on this too. Now this project came about um, because the council was identified a need to improve the process of applicants. 
by presenting information to applicants rather than them needing to search for it. And you'll, you'll see what that looks like when Emily does the demonstration shortly. Within that was a really big opportunity to reduce invalid planning applications, which we understand from some of the research we've been doing accounts for up to or sometimes in excess of 50% of the planning applications received by councils. Now, that was all in train in sort of 2019. Um, and then, of course, last summer along came the Planning for the Future white paper. Now, within the white paper, uh, there was a bit of a a call to to digital to what that what that and what that and a a sense of what that future might look like. So we know um, that lots of parts of the planning white paper have been controversial. The consultation response should be published in the next few weeks. There's obviously been a um, big ministerial change. We don't know exactly how that's going to uh, influence things, but we're expecting the consultation response to come out pretty soon. But the key message um, on the digital and data side was okay moving to a process based on uh, documents to one in the future that will be driven by data and in practice what the kind of digital changes mean are actually making elements of the local digital declaration real within local planning services so standardized data that can be easily accessed and shared between systems really really well designed services that are based around the experience of the user interoperable software that has viewer dependencies and ideally a are just an absolute joy to use, which I, I understand is certainly not the case on current case management systems. And fundamentally underpinning all of this, a more open marketplace, so that there's space for new companies, startups, new tools and technologies that can drastically improve the way that we're planning and engaging with citizens so that they can actually be effectively used. On the MHCLG side, a digital planning program has been set up to support the outcomes, uh, to support the delivery of the outcomes in the white paper. And there are three main strands to that. There's an emphasis on digital local plans and data. There's modern planning software, which is which is where the Ripperbops projects um, sit from our side. And there's also work going on digital citizen engagement. So you might have seen some of the um, other Pathfinder programs that have been launched by the program over the last few months. So in summary, it's a really interesting moment. We've got these three really significant factors coalescing. We've got the planning white paper, a vision for the future of the planning system. We've got a vision for the digital services in local government from the local digital declaration. And we've got three councils specifically proactively collaborating on two interlinking digital planning products that are processing live applications as we speak. Um, they both came from quite different places initially. Um, and with quite different ways of working um, and obviously different delivery partners if you see, as you've seen. But about nine months ago, the two projects started to align their work to build a first end-to-end -end service for law lawful development certificates, which was eventually launched in June and which you're gonna hear a lot more about. Um, this was the MVP, the Minimum Viable Product um, Service. And what we mean by an MVP for anyone who's unfamiliar with that terminology is very literally it's the simplest form of the service that delivers some value. So while you can process applications through the tools at the moment, they're not actually, for example, fully compliant with web accessibility standards. And there's there's other places that need to be developed within them at the moment. But what they're doing is they're giving us this incredible space for testing, for learning and for improving the tools based on the real world feedback that we're getting from applicants, planning officers by the processing of live applications. And since that launch, the teams have been working a lot more closely um, together so that we can continue to evolve these in parallel and in parallel. And so the two tools are working together. After all, it's the same that came to the same councils implementing them. So just a, a quick overview of what this is before we go into the demo, starting with Ripper. Now, under the bonnet of Ripper, if you like, is a flow builder tool that translates um, planning legislation, GPDO legislation at the moment, into ma machine readable data. And these then form the basis um, of the forms that applicants see, which is, in a sense, a further translation of legislation from uh, uh, legalese or, 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 or planglish, I think is the term, into, uh, into plain English. But more importantly, what the forms do is they question, um, they put questions to applicants that are relevant to their own property based on the address that they've entered and only asks questions relevant to that property rather than 
applicants having to go searching for what might be the right kind of um, requirements uh, and, and conditions for that for their property and finding out that information themselves. When they've submitted an application, it's received by BOPS. It, it's sent by an open API and the BOPS interface has been designed following hours and hours of user research and testing with planning officers to improve its efficiency. And then within BOPS, there's other kind of quite nifty tools um, that I think Emily's going to probably talk to you more about. And this one here is a uh, val validations requests module, which means that planning officers can communicate directly with the applicant within BOPS rather than having to go out and to email them which actually we don't always think of as a workaround because we're so used to email but actually that's exactly what it is it's we're having to leave the the system that we're processing applications in and do it elsewhere and the added benefit of something like this is that there's also actually an audit trail within bobs of all of all interactions so you're probably thinking i've been talking for too long and you just want to crack on and see what the fuss is about and we're really proud to to show you the tool and where it is to date um it's been been developing a lot and so Emily I will pass this over to you now to um, take people on the kind of end-to-end -end demo of the service. Thank you Matt and good afternoon everyone. Um, I will try and share my screen. Apologies for the delay. There we go if someone can just confirm my screen is sharing. You're sharing. Fantastic. OK, so I'm going to do an end to end demo of the submission of a lawful development certificate application and the processing uh, of that case in Bob. So this is the starting place place on the Ripper service. Um, so I'm going to take go through the applicant journey. So in this case, I'm going to type in the postcode of my property. And it will pull through some addresses, and this is from a national database of addresses. Which means I can start fetching some property information. So this is retrieving some data that's held on this property. Uh, this is pulled from sort of national and local data sets. So as you can see, the property in question has been highlighted on a map. Some basic information on the property. Um, building type, uh, this is an example of some uh, uh, work in progress still yet to go. Eventually, this will pull through some information on the building type, for example, if it is um, picked up as a residential commercial property, etc. Another thing that the service has done is pulled through planning constraints. And these are this is constraints information has been also pulled through from council and national data where it is held. Um, which saves the applicant having to look at this information for themselves. Um, at the moment, this list is limited to constraints that would affect a lawful development certificate application. But as you can imagine, in time, this list will be expanded. Um, but luckily for this person, uh, this property, there are no planning constraints here that affect their property. So I will continue with my application. Uh, with planning history, this is part of the service that's not yet integrated. Um, this is because, as we know, planning history data um, uh, varies from council to council. Um, and at the moment, this is not integrated. So currently in the user journey, an applicant would still be encouraged to go and uh, search the history of their property, uh, most likely by their uh, planning register or information that's held by the council on their website. So this is one of the first sort of big changes um, in this application service, and this is an alternative way for applicants to provide the uh, the red line plan, site outline, or location plan, as you know it. Uh, this is a, something that's going to be quite different for applicants. This is something we're very keen to hear some live testing on. Uh, generally, applicants will have this already as a as a PDF that they would commission from a, um, a planning consultant or an architect. Um, but this means that applicants may uh, have the ability to do them themselves if they wish. So very keen to hear feedback on this within testing, and hopefully. Uh, by providing a digital uh, red line. So again, that kind of data, not documents approach um, would hopefully reduce some of the reasons for invalidation, for example, uh, not having a north line um, or a scale bar um, to a particular print size because this information is submitted as data. Um, as with most parts of the service, as you'll see throughout, I'll refer to it occasionally, there is help and guidance along the way. Uh, this is to help applicants through some of the more technical parts, maybe provides a legislative source just so all the information we're asking for has um, has uh, justification um, and also some guidance like for example on how to use things such as drawing tools. This will shortly be updated hopefully with some new functionality such as snapping to help with this process but for now as a basic uh, MVP solution um, we hope this offers a, a good alternative for applicants to use in the meantime. I should probably say this uh, map base is uh, from Ordnance Survey so hopefully is a um, sort of good basis for applicants to draw their map on. Um, as you'll see here the service has also calculated uh, the area based off of the red line uh, boundary. Uh, this would obviously help with things such as fee calculations uh, which will come a bit later on the service. 
um, which will hopefully be quite uh, helpful for applicants not having to measure this themselves in a separate tool. Um, of course, if applicants do not wish to use the draw out outline tool, uh, there is the option to upload a file instead. And we do appreciate that not all applicants uh, may be able to use the service, but hopefully this offers a new, offers a new way to provide this, uh, this type of document. Service is now going to start asking me some questions about the project. So over here, this is about distinguishing whether this is a lawful development certificate for proposed use or existing use or development. Um, for this project, I'm going to be doing a proposed change to my property. And for a description of the property, I'm just going to copy and paste to save myself uh, potential typos from typing it. But uh, the project I'm going to be doing today is a proposed construction of a hip to gable roof extension and two roof lights at the front elevation uh, in connection with a loft conversion. So it's a fairly common householder project um, that would be done uh, under an LDC application. On here, the service is now uh, going to start collecting some data. This, well, this is both data and also some uh, I suppose sorting questions to help uh, ask applicants the right question that relates to their property. Um, this is, in theory, a, a bit of a shopping list. Uh, any, mo most projects, particularly aimed at householders, would be encompassed on this list. And applicants would, of course, just select the works that relate to their property. So in this case, I'm going to add some roof lights and I'm also going to extend my roof. Uh, so now I'm going to ask what type of property this is. This relates to sort of what I pointed out earlier on the select property screen. Eventually, when this information is pulled through uh, from a data set, this uh, question could actually be automatically answered for the applicant. But in the meantime, until we're able to pull through from that data, this question should hopefully be something that applicants can, uh, can answer relatively easily. So for this project, um, it is going to be on a house. This is an example of one of these kind of uh, technical questions, which is trying to uh, be posed to the applicant in a way that may be easier to understand. So those familiar with permitted development rights may know that there are certain restrictions on a house that has been converted from a previous use. So in source, instead of posing that to the applicant as saying, was your house converted under this particular piece of legislation, we're trying to use more plain English terms like, for example, was the house always a house um, as a way to hopefully allow applicants to answer this question relatively easily. Um, and in this case, this is all information that I should know um, from my property. But if not, there is an I don't know option, which should mean the applicant should be able to complete the process. It's going to start asking me some more detailed questions. Again, something hopefully data may be able to answer in the future, but the illustrations will hopefully help applicants answer this if they're unsure. For my project, it is going to be a semi-detached house. This is an, an example of more data being gathered by the service. So usually you would just have your, uh, your proposal description that would contain the amount of roof lights. But actually the service is now able to start collecting that as data. So in this case, I'm able to select uh, the amount of numbers and this will be provided uh, to the local planning authority, um, which may help with uh, further analysis uh, down the line. This is again picking out some of those kind of planning questions. Um, this is an example, uh, anyone who's again familiar with permitted development rights may know that one of these is more likely to be more permitted development than the other. Um, and this is not something that's hidden from the applicant. Um, if they look uh, in the further guidance, they will see that if it does protrude more than 15 centimetres, then that is something that would require planning permission and perhaps not be something that someone doing an LDC should do. Um, I will just in the meantime assume that this is underneath 15 centimetres and that it is lower than the uh, than the top of the roof. Um, it was to the front elevation. So again, diagrams help applicants navigate this fairly easily. And likewise on sort of complicated uh, roof projects, some people may not um, necessarily uh, understand what the term of their, uh, their, their roof project is. Uh, so these diagrams kind of help them sort it out. So on here, I can see that that is what I want to do. I'm gonna be converting a hip roof to a gable roof. And it's now going to start asking me some more detailed questions on that. So something that this service does do is it tries to help applicants um, if they do happen to uh, maybe go down the route where their project may not be covered by permitted development rights. It does try to assist them. So, for example, um, if I was to select, select something that um, me as a planner, planner version of me knows is maybe not permitted development, but an applicant may not, they can still continue through the service. This is just warning users uh, in that big shopping list of projects that they should include roof lights, but hopefully that's something that can be more seamless in future iterations. And answer a few more questions about the project. So it will not overhang and it will not extend beyond the plane of the front roof slope. And it is going to be 50 meters cubed or less. Materials will be similar and the extension will not include a balcony. No alterations to the chimneys. It was always a house. 
And as you can see here, the services detected uh, that the answer to this question was that the new dormer would be higher than the original roof slope. And all it's warning the user, it says it looks like these changes will require planning permission. We've seen some of this in live testing. We see this is a very good service to applicants because it means they potentially avoid uh, doing an application that uh, would not get them the outcome that they need. So we will go back and we will change our answers. And this is something that applicants can do if they go through the service and they see that that's the result they get, they may want to amend their service and actually submit a uh, application that uh, would not require planning permission. So I will again just go through these questions. Not include a balcony, no alterations to chimneys. And it was always a house. Now it's going to start collecting some data about materials. So materials is something that's usually found labelled um, on plans as we go through. And this is very much still a part of the service that's work in progress, because what we're trying to work out is, is, is what is the value of collecting data on materials. Um, we do know in some cases that officers would find, uh, for example, a property in a conservation area, that actually knowing the, the, that level of detail on materials may be valuable. Um, but we do understand that this is not something that applicants would necessarily uh, be used to. So this is very much something we're still working on getting feedback on and working with our partners and stakeholders to uh, to find the best solution for this. But for now, it encourage it may be just um, introduces the idea to applicants of, uh, I suppose, providing this information as data rather than um, a label on a plan. Just complete these it will not include any new windows or any new doors. Now some information about me. So this would be uh, part of the application form. Anyone submitting a lawful development certificate will be familiar with. So for this, I am going to have the very original name of test test. And I'm going to be Dr. Test Test. I like to think of this as my planning applicant pseudonym. Um, my, this is starting to ask some information about whether any additional contact information is needed. So I'm obvious if, if I was to say uh, no, my contact information would not be the same, then it would collect that information as needed. But if it is the same as the property address, then obviously there is no need to collect that further. Um, I'm going to put in my email and my not telephone number. Likewise, the same information about um, a site visit contact. Some information on ownership. So this moves away from uh, what we've known as the certificate A to D on the standard planning application form and instead tries to approach uh, the questions with applicants in a different way. We do know that ownership certificates are um, more of a thing for full planning permission, but it's again just exploring uh, the best way to identify ownership from applicants through this LDC service. Um, now for drawings and evidence. So I'm going to pull out some plans that I conveniently prepared earlier. Um, but this is so the service uh, encourages applicants to submit plans on um, individual documents. Um, we do know this is not always the case. So this is something we're testing with users. Um, some uh, may still want to submit all of their plans on uh, one uh, document. Uh, the service doesn't penalise them, of course. They can, of course, just put the um, uh, put the plan in multiple slots. It's going to ask some other qualifying questions, and what this does is determines whether any additional uh, plans are needed. So for example, if it didn't show the entire property, uh, the applicant would be encouraged to submit a site plan in addition. But as the other plans do show the full boundary, this is not needed. Uh, this is an example where um, an applicant may not have a roof plan, but if they have a floor plan that shows uh, the, the dimensions of the roof, um, then hopefully applicants are still able to complete that and provide the information. But at the very least, this provides a um, prompt to make sure that applicants have uh, provided the necessary information. And these plans have been identified based off of the project um, that the applicant has, uh, has selected. And also there's a 13, 30 megabyte file size on um, plans at the moment, which has been received with quite, uh, quite good reviews so far. So there's again one of those sorting questions. This would be a prompt for any sections. Um, I do not want to upload any photographs, visualizations. Um, uh, this is this is a thing, a um, part that is just introduced in testing at the moment. So because the draw site outline is relatively new to applicants, um, if they have provided a location plan in testing, uh, we don't want to disadvantage them in, in testing if, for example, they um, are not comfortable using the drawing tool, but we would still like to get their feedback. So for anyone who is submitting a location plan document, the service does try to give them uh, the best guidance uh, possible to make sure that that location plan is, is valid. Uh, just for testing purposes, I will be um, uploading a, a uh, location plan as part of this. 
But as with everything, these all have some guidance and some legislative sources that uh, provide justifications to why this is needed. And now moving on to more questions about my application and what this is going to do is identify the fee relevant to the proposal. So this is going to uh, ascertain whether any reductions or exemptions may be uh, applicable to this application um, without sort of being too overwhelming uh, to the applicant. They obviously do not need to necessarily go through the fee regulations. Uh, this service very kindly identifies that based off of the information they've provided. But in this case, this, this uh, application is not a resubmission. Um, or uh, eligible for any exemptions. So this is a nice summary to the user of all the information they've provided so far. They can obviously go back and change their answers. Um, obviously quite a lot of questions, so that's sort of being worked on in future iterations, but is a good, uh, good sort of glance for applicants to see what they've submitted so far. And lastly, the legal declarations part. So as you can see, the service very much feels like a, um, a very, very uh, expanded version of an application form. It is now calculated that the fee for my project would be £103, which I can confirm that would be the fee for this project. Um, now I'm going to go to GovPay, uh, which is the payment uh, payment engine that's being used for this service. So it will just connect me through. Here we go. Uh, so I'm going to use some test payment information. And I will use my other, my other pseudonym. And I will also use that just so I can show what happens next. So very simple, GovUK is used on a lot of existing, um, existing payment paid services. So this should be something that applicants um, should feel comfortable using. This is something we will work out more in testing. Apologies for the delay. <laughs> there we go. So now it is sending the data. And that is my completed application process. So as an applicant uh, with all that information up front, uh, fairly, fairly straightforward, hopefully. This is something that testing will tell us more about. Uh, the end screen just sort of gives them a bit more information about uh, what applicants can expect. Um, I will now go over to my emails where I have received a notification. And I will just flash this up on screen quickly. So on here, I've got my receipt payment from GovUK. I've also got my confirmation from the back office planning system that my application has been received. So this is a statutory notification that just confirms that the, uh, that the application has been received. And I'm gonna go over to BOPS and show the other half of the process. So this is the BOPS interface, which I will just walk through um, very simply. And as you can see, we have a new application. Uh, so this is the screen main, uh, you, the screen that an officer would see in the back office system, various tabs that sort of show the different types of applications throughout their process. And you can sort them by uh, applications allocated uh, to you, the officer, or um, uh, all of the ones that are available. I will go into this new application received. So this is the information um, from the application that I've just submitted. So all the information has been provided. That was the description that I wrote. It's pulled through the UPRN. It's pulled through all the payment information very handily. It's also given me a link uh, to Google Maps if I as an officer uh, wanted to do a desktop, uh, quick desktop view of the property. I'll wait and see while that loads and I'll just walk through uh, the rest. This is the site map as drawn by the applicant on the same base map, which means uh, we can very easily sort of uh, check and there shouldn't be any uh, errors in um, in how that's been drawn. 
the result from the API user. So this is actually the result uh, that uh, the Ripper service determines. So the Ripper service found that, uh, well, believes based on the information provider that this would be permitted development. So it's just because the officer, quick glance of an initial assessment, but obviously this would have to, uh, uh, the officer would then need to go and check any planning history, uh, for example, anything that removes uh, PD rights, uh, any historic uh, conditions, etc. The proposal details, these are all the questions answered by the applicants that would contain everything um, that was in the uh, in the application form. So if I was looking for information on ownership, it will be in there. The documents as submitted by the applicant, I will go through these shortly. Any constraints identified by Ripper in that GIS query? Um, in this case, there were no constraints, but um, if, for example, there was any inaccuracies, um, I'd be able to manually update and override those uh, key application dates automatically calculated from when the application was received. Um, contact information for the applicant. And uh, of, uh, there is a section here on consultation. Obviously, consultation is not uh, necessarily a piece of core functionality for the Lawful Development Certificate Service, but you can imagine where this may go in the future. And then here is the step by step process of as an officer, what I would go through uh, to validate the application. So I will um, run through this process. So the first thing I would do is I would go into the documents and take a look at them. So conveniently, because of the slots that these documents were uh, uploaded in, they've been pre-tagged accordingly. So if you remember when the app can saw uh, upload your existing floor plans here, um, roof plans, elevations, etc. Um, this is sort of pre-tagged them, which is very helpful as an officer when you're going through sort of documents. Um, I would then go into each of these individually. Um, I, would, uh, I would download them. I'd measure them, make sure they scale correctly, etc. Um, as part of the validation process, um, I'm going to say, that this document is valid. I'm going to give it the um, plan reference of one. I do want it on the decision notice um, and it will be publicly available. And what that means is for the um, the uh, API that would uh, maybe go on to a future planning register, but that uh, is not currently within scope of the projects, but you can imagine where that would go. Likewise with proposed floor plans. That is all, all valid. Plan two. And so this roof plan uh, would probably not be needed because it is a duplicate document. So I'm going to archive it. So archiving just means I can organize my documents and um, make sure that no duplicate plans sneak in. Uh, but it's all presented on the same screen as you'll see uh, shortly. So it's quite uh, quite an easy user interface. So this document that I've archived is now just at the bottom. If I did for whatever reason make a mistake, I'd be able to restore it uh, with the click of a button. That will be the same for this one, I'll archive it. And with these existing elevations, that's all valid. Wanted on the decision notice. And uh, just to show off this functionality, um, I'm going to hypothetically uh, say, well, actually, I believe the scale bar is going to be missing from this plan. Um, if I were validating this, I would say that this is not a valid document as it is missing a uh, missing a scale bar. So I'd not be able to validate it. As you can see on here, scale bar is missing. So the document is not valid because scale bar is missing. I would then give that a reference. I would not want to put it on the decision notice because it is an invalid document. is now giving me a warning that I have an invalid document as part of this application. And then there is the, this location plan. So any document that doesn't come through tagged, and there may be many reasons why that is, officers can obviously manually uh, tag themselves. So in this case, I would tag this as a site plan. And this one would be valid, and I would call it the location plan. Uh, and I want that on decision notice. So that is all my documents managed very quickly at a glance. We do, however, have this case of this invalid document. So I'm going to request from the applicant that they uh, submit a revised version. And this is done through the validation request feature that Matt mentioned. So I'm going to add a request to the applicant and I'm going to request that they replace the document. It is identified that this is the document that was deemed invalid and it's pulled through the invalid reason. So this will be presented to the applicant uh, as the reason why they are to do this. Um, this revised document. I will pull that together and I will invalidate the application. So the application has been invalidated and an email has been sent and very shortly uh, 
me, the applicant, will receive an email from the back office system telling me that my application is invalid. As you can see here, fortunately it's invalid and has not been registered. So it's now going to request that I make changes, which I will do. I will open up this URL. And um, while this is loaded, you can see on here it's pulled through the Google Maps um, uh, of the property if I wanted to uh, take a look at it. So that's very handy. But we're now going into that uh, validation request module. So this is what the applicant would see when they open that link. So it's all been calculated. Uh, it's given the applicant uh, 15 working days and told them the date uh, to respond to this request. Um, and it's given the uh, replacement document that I need to do. But you could imagine if there were multiple replacement documents, these would be listed here all on this screen. So in this case, uh, it was this document that was uh, made invalid because the scale bar was missing. So the user would then select the revised plan and submit that. So there we go, they've completed their action. So then me as an officer would then look at this application. I would then maybe go off and uh, do some other applications while it's taking place, but it's told me I've had one new response to a validation request. So if I open this, it says they have responded with a document. So very conveniently, this revised document has um, automatically been sent into the document section. So as you can see, the um, previous document that was invalid has been automatically archived and the revised version has been automatically put into the document management area. I would then go into this and check this. If it was incorrect, I would go and ask for um, further amended plans. I need to re-tag it. So this was a uh, proposed elevation. It is now valid. And it's plan number four. And I will do it on the decision notice. So with that, all of the documents are now uh, valid and I will start my determination. Currently with the MVP service, uh, there is no uh, way to do an officer report within uh, the BOP system. But I would then, as an officer, oh, first I need to mark the application as valid. So I would enter the date. Uh, this is automatically uh, configured as the time that the uh, request response was received, which is very useful for backdating. But with that, everything is now valid and the application is now ready for assessment. Uh, the applicant, which will be me, will also have received a notification automatically saying that my application has been validated, giving me my planning application reference and a uh, due date for a decision. Now going into the second part of the assessment. So this is a very basic screen at the moment. As I said, officer report is not uh, is not fully fully um, integrated into BOPS at the moment. This is something I would do elsewhere, but this is where the assessment is recorded. Um, so in this case, I've done my assessment. I've checked through all the proposal details and the plans, and I believe that the use or operation is lawful in this case um, as the project uh, is uh, compliant with permitted development rights. So I would copy the relevant extract uh, from my officer report and this will be shown on the decision notice. Um, I would also now want to send this off to my manager to just uh, to make sure that I've made the right decision and also for them to sign off, uh, sign off the application. So um, see, see documents, um, I believe this is client. Now we'll save. It now is telling me to submit my recommendation. So this is a decision notice that has been drafted based of all the information provided. So you can get a glimpse of what it might look like, um, saying this would be granted, um, it'd say this is the applicant's name, all the information, site address, etc. It is also given the reasons that I provided as an officer, as well as all the plans that were submitted as part of the application and the red line that has been um, drawn and approved by the uh, by the person validating the application. So I think this all looks good. Um, I will submit it to my manager and just double check. Now is moved to waiting determination. And now I'm going to, have to put on my third hat, which is as a manager. So as you can see in here, I have a case that has been uh, passed to me uh, to sign off. This is case 699, which is the one we've been working on. Um, as an officer, I would then review the assessment. So what this is saying here is what uh, the case officer has written, along with any additional comments. I could then, as a manager, go through, check the proposal details, check the documents and also make a similar assessment. Um, in this case, uh, I do agree with the recommendation. Um, all looks good. And I will save that. 
Obviously, if I disagreed with the assessment, I could send it back to the case officer uh, where they could then review their assessment and um, redo that workflow. But this has all been good in this case. Now I'm going to move forward to publishing the determination. So as I see now the decision notice um, as proposed, I will do a check through, make sure everything is correct. And assuming I'm happy, I will then determine the application. And this will um, complete the application process in Bob's. And a decision notice has been sent to the applicant. So me as the applicant will be sent a decision notice by email. As you can see here. And here I have my PDF decision notice. And that is the end of the demo. Happy to take any questions or if there's anything else anyone would like to see, uh, do let me know. Thanks, Emily. I hope that's uh, well more than the flavour of uh, what you can expect from the tools. So yeah, now's a great moment for us to pause for a few minutes for any specific questions around that and, and to Emily. So please just uh, just come off mute and yeah, hand, hands up's great as well, Jessica. Hi everyone, um, that was a really great demo, Emily. Thank you for that. Um, I just wondered, in terms of sort of the user feedback, um, what what's the level of sort of engagement from them? Um, have they genuinely found that oh, it's much easier than the process before? You know, can you tell us something about that? Uh, absolutely, and I'd obviously welcome uh, input from the other sort of partners in the room. Um, speaking from what I've seen, there's definitely seems to be a bit of difference in the feedback between uh, what we call sort of agent uh, applicants and also sort of householder applicants. Um, as you probably saw from the service, it's, it's very much geared at sort of non-technical users. Uh, so it's very much a different way that something like a, a planning consultant or an agent may be used, may be used to. I'd say overall, uh, it has it has been very positively received. I think that uh, people appreciate that it's it's fairly simple to use. However, in contrast to the existing you know application forms for example I know we've had sort of mixed feedback on um, for example maybe there being uh, there are a lot of questions which you do appreciate that so that's a, that's a really good piece of feedback that we, we're taking back and just uh, make really double checking about whether we can streamline some of those questions um, the level of engagement I think has been very good uh, council partners have been actively uh, promoting uh, users to, to express interest in using the tool um, generally we've we've had a, a lot of users uh, express interest which is great um, through sort of show and tell uh, call out um, uh, things like link, LinkedIn posts, uh, social media, etc. Um, we've also been promoting this to our local agents, um, where you know um, they they uh, if they have some time that they're willing to spare, we really uh, would love to see them use the tool. Um, and then we're still actively testing at the moment. So bearing in mind with the eight-week uh, application process, we're, so we're, we've got uh, quite a lot of. Uh, feedback from applicants using the tool um, but we, we still are, we still need to get through kind of that second half of the process to get more feedback on that so users seem very engaged and positive there's been a lot of suggestions on maybe things to improve or things to maybe revisit um, but the probably the, the the best well the biggest area of feedback we got is that um, it looks like these changes require planning permission screen because that was actually an area of feedback I don't think we were expecting uh, people saying uh, almost not responding because they were like okay I, I'm, I'm going to go and do another type of planning application so any feedback we have got um, has has really been very helpful um, and just finding out how long it's taken them or what information they've needed so hopefully that answers your question but I do um, invite uh, Tom and Toby to maybe share their thoughts on the feedback also. Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what uh, Emily's just said because I think she's covered it fairly comprehensively. Um, I would say that uh, yes I mean we've definitely got some very useful feedback from users uh, and uh, uh, we, we know that there's still some aspects of it that we still have to develop further and then you know some key things that uh, uh, users are, uh, and particularly agents are keen for things like the nominate payment uh, sort of approach things like that uh, and obviously 
we are sort of uh, looking at those and prioritizing those uh, because we uh, and another thing we're prioritizing currently is accessibility as well because we we want to get this uh, up onto council websites uh, to make it much easier for people to submit at the moment we sort of we we sort of have it slightly obscured uh, and uh, uh, and we invite people to uh, to submit applications and then provide them with a link to do so so uh, I think generally like I said uh, I, I almost universally people are happy with the the interface they, they find it much easier and sort of simpler uh, at least uh, the layout and the, and the like uh, to use uh, they like the fact that uh, it has so many of these these sort of features like the site map they like uh, uh, the way that it provides the sort of guidance as you go along uh, through the steps and, and refers to the legislation uh, and like I said uh, they are, are also providing those uh, those sort of uh, uh, requests for additional uh, um, services that we're prioritizing for inclusion Great, thanks, Toby. Any more any more questions um, at this stage? There will be another opportunity for questions after you've heard from Tom and unfortunately me for a little bit longer. But please put anything in the chat as we're going along as well. And, and as you've seen, Toby's on hand to be replying to some of those um, if needed. So, Tom, I'll um, I'll share my screen if that's right, because you're going to talk us through a thanks, bit of your, yeah. your journey in Southwark and how um, you. Kind of yeah, that's great. I just say to thanks. This and be involved in this. Yeah, sure. And just a quick thanks to Emily for such a great demo. Thanks, Emily. That was a really great demo. So um, it's always good to see because we work on the iteration of the tools. It's great to see it all at the one in one one time. So it's 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 really good. Um, thanks, uh, Matt. Do you want to jump onto the next slide? So, as we all know, kind of Ripper and Bob's are, are still in still in development. You know, we are we have the MVPs. It's just demoed. Of both tools but um, it's still a very much a, a work in progress but as we've heard around the feed, user feedback it's really positive um, and um, it, there's whenever we put it in front of planning officers they can see the the progress the tools made and and, and the differences in terms of that kind of user experience um, which is um, which is really positive to hear um, but Southwark and I know uh, Lambeth and, uh, and Buckinghamshire have both been on this project since the beginning, where it it, it kind of started off as, as a number of ideas, um, particularly around um, you know produce, as as Ripper's name is reducing valid planning applications. You know, there's there's so many and um, there's such a, a different range of experiences that applicants can receive. Um, but also, um, we recognise that maybe some of our existing systems were you know didn't actually meet maybe some of the expectations that we kind of require we, we would expect from from modern software so at the very beginning of this whole project we did you know we went through this agile process of of discoveries and alphas and this was ripper and bop side by side kind of two two kind of digital innovation projects and and the reason why southern council decided to get involved was one, we were kind of we signed up for the local digital declaration, and we were really committed to actually improving our services, primarily for our for our residents on behalf of you know our members, uh, uh, but also kind of thinking about the quality of uh, experience that our planning officers have, um, and obviously a, a planning application software uh, or or similar is is just one part of our service design, and but we recognise there's other elements of our service that needs to improve, but software is such an integral part. And this opportunity came along and we thought, well, there's a, quite a commitment here, but actually being in the room and shaping the opportunity for what we want to deliver as a council, as a local planning authority was, was such a great um, opportunity, which is why we, we are we're, we're on both projects. We also recognise that you know, digital planning for, for, for a really sort of broad term is kind of part of where this is where the future of the planning service was going that we recognize that there was huge scope within both projects to really kind of cover a lot of ground however i think in hindsight we've covered we've got to ldcs um and obviously we're starting to look at householder etc but there is a lot of work um because we all know that the planning system is obtuse archaic complicated etc etc but we recognize that by being in the room being part of it we could be part of that um, and one other thing, we 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 actually have a at Southwark here. We have a um, we have a, a digital strategy for our planning division, 
and we set up a team within the planning division who uh, are called a digital transformation team and this obviously improving existing software but also being involved in uh, developing future software um, and that which is now obviously existing software for LDC applications was a was a big part of that uh, digital strategy which aligned with both software and hardware and processes and very much linked to that kind of data first approach. Um, so Ripper and Bops are a number of, are two of the number of projects we're doing in Southwark around our our service and the design of our service. So, it, so um, who's involved? Um, uh, planning policy. I, I'm a team leader in planning policy. We have this digital transformation team as well. Um, so we have a number of officers um, kind of involved on the day to day kind of running of the project. But we also have a, a cohort of planning officers, validation officers, etc. Uh, managers who are testing both Ripper and Bops because it's their feedback. The, the kind of these are the experts um, of the development uh, process who can give us the best feedback. So we work closely with them. We've also had to work really closely with our IT teams, um, with our legal teams to around contracts, um, around data protection, um, and. A lot of these kind of wider stakeholders within the council are kind of we need to reassure them that this is this is where we're going with this because it's you know it's it's software development councils don't usually get involved with soft development although I'm sure some do uh, but it was very much kind of hand holding and, and actually MHLG have been fantastic as have partner boroughs um, kind of holding each other's hands in some ways although maybe that's just Southwark um, who needed their hand holding especially at so we say different levels of management um, but it's kind of yeah we've we've had the support to kind of bring in our internal stakeholders on board and there's a general um, ethos at Southwark Council to deliver these digital better digital services and that's there's been strong member support strong chief exec support for this process and obviously it helps to have MHCLG funding uh, because that's that's really key um, but it's uh, yeah it's been a been a journey taking everyone with us um, those stakeholders are also responsible for what we called like our ecosystem our digital ecosystem the software the kind of permissions all that kind of thing and that's that's been really helpful um, having partners alongside us to work through those uh, integration kind of issues and and in some ways um, we've kind of we've been through the growing pains on this with all our partners and you know from what was a very much two discoveries looking at these these issues to actually processing live lawful development certificate applications using these tools now is a is a huge kind of a huge number of steps to get there so the projects have could have evolved continually. You know, they've been agile. So are we going to focus on this? Are we going to focus on that functionality? And at first, the two projects were kind of aligned, misaligned in a sense of timing, because our funding streams were in different places throughout the year. And actually, with when both pro project, both tools have got to MVP, we've recognized the need to align both projects. And, and MHCLG with Matt here and, and, and Michael. Mentesi have been integral to the alignment of the projects. So both projects are coming together and we're working really hard to almost be one project with two, two tools. And I think that's that's very much an ongoing process. And that um, I think this is a, that's a key kind of requirement for where both projects are right now in terms of the next phases of development, bringing it together to get the best out of the projects. And obviously for you, for you all in the room, it's a great opportunity now to be part of that because as I said, we've been through the growing pains almost and now we're ready to then go wider and, 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 and get more involvement. Um, and that, that's, uh, I think that's a great testament to the, the hard work and the dedication um, of both, of all partners and MHMG as well to, to get to this. Um, we have to admit it's been a commitment. You know, we have, it has taken hours of officer time, both officers who are funded uh, by MHMG funding, but also officer time in just general officers who are doing their job, delivering caseloads of planning applications. Um, but we found officers really responsive to that. They've, they've, been, they've really, taken to kind of seeing part being part of a of a kind of an innovation program we've also seen some skepticism from managers who've been in the game <laughs> um, we've also you know and we've worked hard on that to show actually as the tool is iterating and progressing um, it's delivering the features 
that um, not only are present in, in, in existing legacy systems, but actually goes beyond that and delivers the new experience. Because what we're doing here is not building what we have already. We're building new functionality. And hopefully some of the examples that M showed this afternoon, especially around that kind of interface between, this is for BOPS, between the interface between the case officer and the applicant, that's not in uniform anymore. Sorry, it's sorry, it's not in Outlook anymore. Um, it's all recorded in the tool, and that's great for the audit log. It really speeds up the process we're finding. So that's that's really great to have um, planning officers to test that and and, and be part of that. Um, yeah, I think that covers that slide, Matt. Should we jump on to the next slide? So I mean, one, I think the first question was was around you know. Who are you working with to make sure this is what we want? And as we've said, you know, we've we've worked with not only planning officers but managers, the validation officers, to to try and meet their needs. Now, um, software development has been a a learning experience for us all, and it was like, well, why can't we build this now? Why can't we have this now? So, understanding kind of managing expectations um, and understanding people's needs has been really important for the for the officers who are on the project teams for Ripper and Bob's. So we can we can clearly communicate the time it takes, the processes involved in this in this because this isn't an off-the-shelf product right now. It's going that way, um, but in some ways, some 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 colleagues almost demand the off-the-shelf product right now. But as we say, we're building this to meet needs because it hasn't been done recently. A product which meets planning officers' needs, but it's also to mention important to think about the applicants too. Because actually, um, we have done testing with applicants. They have fed back to the processes. And now we're using the live applications. Applicants are giving us the feedback on the process. Because at the end of the day, they don't really, they just want a quick decision and a, and a great experience. And this is what we're trying to deliver through 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 BOPS and, um, and through Ripper. And I guess on the flip side, planners, us in the room um, who are working on the project, we're working with some really great uh, teams in terms of uh, uh, user uh, interface designers, software developers who are delivering, who are making these tools with us, and they're fantastic. And when I started on the project, I didn't know anything about soft software design, really, you know, a little bit. But actually, um, you pick stuff up and you don't feel like you have to know the code. You don't have to know this. You just have to be really clear on what you want and why you want it and why planning is the way it is and almost challenging the planning system well why do we have to say this on a decision notice can we just say something more uh, more simply or, or similar so we there's a list of kind of issues that we raise with mhclg well we have to do this because mh because the legislation says this so maybe we change the legislation those kind of things and, and obviously working with mhclg has been fantastic being part of this um, as matt touched on this at the beginning being part of this kind of emerging digital planning paradigm that is part of you know planning by paper it's less controversial, you know. I mean, speaking from Southwark, we're a Labour council, um, and you know, we're dedicated to this project um, because it's going to deliver best customer, better customer service, and a better experience from our residents and our applicants. So that's really great. It can get a bit political at times, but we're focusing on that. Um, in terms of how we work, um, we we are aligning both projects now. From all, for, so both project teams are working together. Um, that's going to ensure our collaborative working continues and we work all together constructively on the projects. Having two project teams coming together um, develops more opportunities uh, for understanding the flow of information through both tools and actually creates better, pro uh, better products, um, which, is, which is great to see. Um, we've obviously received funding uh, from MHCLG to fund some staffing costs, and I'm sure Matt's gonna cover this shortly, but that's obviously been critical to our um, to to us being part of this project um, and committing the kind of the valuable officer time to that. And um, I think and Matt's can touch on this, but you know the available pots are there for future councils. I won't say any more about that because I know it's going to be covered. But it's great to see that this is such an important project, obviously at the national level, but it's going to be delivered by local planning authorities to make it the best product it is, and the funding there makes gives us you know um the kind of the confidence that we'll do that um and i think i say we've touched on the growing pains we've been for a lot over the past couple of years and you find us right now at a really great junction with this alignment 
and two working MVPs. And we're so excited to kind of get stuck into Householder next. There's obviously some stuff we need to do around that, uh, lawful development certificate still, uh, firm up that validation process, the the uh, submitting um, kind of uh, amendments to schemes post validation um, in negotiation with the case officer, and lots of other things as well. I mean, there's you start talking and there's there's just it just on, off you go. Um, but it is a great a great time, and and I think we did a show and tell this morning and, and just stepping back and it's it's always good we work kind of you know in a um in a, by sprints so every two weeks we develop new functionality and it's great to step back and just see which is exactly actually what emily demoed to us the whole journey of a planning application here and, and actually what we've achieved so it's a great time to be part of that and and deliver kind of the next next phase really of uh of improving these tools so i think that's probably enough from me matt um can i hand back to you Great, yeah. Thanks, Tom, for sharing your your perspectives, some of the challenges you've been through, uh, and I think already doing a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of opportunities. So, yeah, um, I might not be saying quite as much as I was planning. So I'm just going to briefly talk about where we're going next with all of this. Um, so Tom's spoken a lot about this kind of project alignment that's been going on. Number one, as I said earlier, it's kind of a shifting gear as this is now part of the kind of national planning reform program it's not just two uh two innovation projects uh, which is kind of how how the funding was seen anyway in the, in the first instance from our perspective it's moving from being something that was led and de delivered by councils to being led and delivered by councils in partnership with mhclg but with a really strong coordination um resource really provided by us to keep things all ticking over and actually I, as as we see it, to try and free council staff up from some of the sort of organisational work, so that we can uh, use your brains to help us um, feed to, to help feed into what the product product should look like, and to really inform that design process. As Tom has said, with with this alignment and since the LDC, there's much more of a feeling of we're one team who are working to develop two products. It's the same councils, the same three councils who are implementing both products in their individual councils. It's not like, like some are just doing one and some are doing the other. So we're really cohesive in that regard. And we're working at the moment on really setting much clearer expectations of, of what the commitments from partner councils should be and what MHCLG's contribution to those would be. So we know that, um, that Council staff have said, well, I've got my caseload here that I have to work on and I'm struggling, therefore, to work or to dedicate the two days a week that I'm needed on this project. And I'm struggling even to argue that internally because as the caseload increases, then I've I kind of am, am taken away from the from the actual um, Ripperbox project work. Now, we know that that's a concern. Um, and what we've been doing is outlining much more clearly what are the different kind of functions that people with certain skill sets within councils need to perform within the projects so that rather than councils nominating people forwards to do certain things, we're actually presenting more of a cohesive list for you with requirements and time commitments attached to that. And most importantly, and this is the last the last bullet point here, uh, funding to resource those people's involvement. Um, so if someone is going to be spending three days of their week working on this, we will pay back for costs for those three days, for example. And in getting that into a more structured way is, is being really helpful in terms of ensuring that, that there's kind of consistency in the team, that people don't feel like they're stretched in different directions um, between the project work and internal, um, internal case work, for example. Um, and actually, I'm just gonna make one more point on the previous slide before I move on, or maybe I'll make it now. Um, while it, you know, I've talked about the planning white paper. I've talked about more involvement from MHCLG. These projects are absolutely led by the needs of councils and planning officers and applicants within and to councils, because if we don't have those inputs, then the projects that are being designed just they're, they're not going to be fit for purpose or they're very quickly going to be out of date. So while the um, the delivery method is shifting slightly into a, a slightly more structured way is absolutely still still got um, councils needs and leadership at its core. As part of that, and to illustrate this, 
we've been working through a series of really extensive workshops over the last six weeks to kind of come up with joint visions, identifying the next highest priority items that we need to be working on, be it application types or functionality such as systems integrations into um, into IDOX Uniform or, or, or Northgate systems, whatever you're using, and also to collectively establish our shared working practices. So, so what you've got on that slide is just an example of something from a workshop where we're starting to talk about what's the value we can deliver, deliver at different stages and, and what that might look like across a journey. And this is this is really a, a key point that this is a journey. Um, now, just to, to use a metaphor briefly, if we're trying to devise the fastest mode of transport and probably we have in our head that that's something like a car or a train. Um, well, that's 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 where we think at the moment in the future. But what we've got right now with this lawful development uh, MVP is this It's a skateboard. It's something that's functional and it works and it is an end to end service. Uh, that councils can use, but just for that one application type. We want to get to something that looks a bit like a car, but there's going to be many steps along the way. In the future, you know, we've identified needs and in this in this uh, analogy, it might be the need for more stability or an ability to steer things, which might see the next iteration being a scooter. In the future, there might be the need for to move faster, so it might be a bicycle. Could be it could be a motorbike when you introduce an engine, and it's very much the development process that we're going to be following in the next um, in the next few years, really, with regards to these projects, which is different bits of functionality and different application types coming online at different times. It's not going to be big bang by any chance, uh, but by um, any stretch of the imagination. So there will be dual running at different times, and maybe you, you've got some questions about that because the team are already working on ways to make this as light as possible for everyone. As um, Tom alluded to, that's one area where there have been some quite recent um, growing pains. And I think we probably still have some of the stretch marks from that whilst we're still working out exactly how we navigate that. But for future councils, a lot of those um, those challenges will have, have been overcome. We've really seen this as a learning, a learning process throughout. And so again, to reiterate what Tom said, by joining or, or following the project more closely from now on, you'll have an important voice in terms of shaping these projects and ultimately hopefully being ahead of the curve when it comes to implementing some of the future changes in, in legislation, um, but also having a um, fit for purpose um, planning software. So there's two great opportunities to, um, to get involved. Immediately, you can actually get in touch with um, with Emily via this uh, planning.digital.bucks.gov.uk email or Tom box.southwark.gov.uk to have a play around with those tools yourselves and actually to also hopefully contribute your feedback back to us and act as testers that help us to refine and improve them going forwards. So please, if you're interested or if you want to share this with your colleagues, you know, that's a, that's a great way to find out a bit more and takes you beyond just the demo. Coming up soon, uh, we at MHCLG will be launching an expressions of interest for new council partners to join Ripperbox. Um, we're expecting to launch that in mid to late October. We're looking for at least five councils and there will be substantial support available. I can't say exactly how much at the moment, but it will be um, kind of six figure sums of money. The intention being that we provide support for you to backfill or subsidise staff costs so that those people can work with the project team both on the co-design of the tools but also the implementation of them internally um, and that's going to be people from from across different parts of the service we're, we're working that out at the moment but i think that will be that will be presented and made available to um to anyone who's going through this process further on so please look out for that and uh, by the way i will email everyone that's registered for these events um, when that goes live, just just to give you my assurances on that. Um, now, when we launch the expression of interest, it's important to say it won't just be a case of putting in an application based on you being interested in it or you being ambitious. Those are really, really important elements and we would love people that are ambitious and interested, but there will be certain things that you will need to do or have in place before you can join and those will relate to people, um, to having approvals, the shape of your data, um, IT policies perhaps and integrations. I'm sure there'll be legal elements and the brand identity is slightly different, but that's having a nice skin that says it's your council, not just, you know, generic BOPS uh, product. 
And to go into that in a bit more detail, we do have a draft onboarding checklist. We're refining this at the moment so that we can share this when the EOI is, is announced so that people can look at those and almost you can self-assess your readiness. And this is a brief indication of some of the things that you can expect to see. So Gov.uk UK Pay is, is the, the payment service or payments engine that is being used for this. You have to be able to use that. There are certain IT related things, in particular, having the right uh, data protection agreements in place and impact assessments. All of this stuff in orange is um, it, it corresponds to GIS data that needs to be in the right shape so that it can be called upon by the tools. So there's, there's, this is going to be refined. We're in the process of doing that. But just to make you aware that that's going to almost be the first step of the process for you understanding whether it now will be the right time to join um, to join the, the team if you are interested in doing so. But I, would, I thought I would just leave you with um, a few things that you can do immediately to almost get the ball rolling so you're ready for some of this. <clears throat> I would say if, if, if I had to, to, if someone were to ask me, which you haven't, but I'm, I'm sure you, you want to, what those would be, I would say um, planning director approvals. Number one, I mean, is does your service want this? Um, already engage with your finance and I teams to understand their uh, amenity uh, and, and I don't know if that's the right word, willingness, let's say, to get involved in this. And if you can work out the status of your GIS data at the moment, what kind of state is it in? Because there actually may be support from MHCLG to help selected councils to do this if it's not all immediately ready. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it um, from me on this. So just look out for that in um, around a month or so's time.